Divine Truth Spirit Guidance Discussions Guidance from people who have lived on Earth and who have now passed into the spirit world. The title of this guidance from spirits is Sonia Encourages a Longing for Truth, during which Mary channels Sonia, a celestial spirit who gave guidance for people watching or attending the assistance groups in 2016 and who now returns to highlight the need for those who attend or watch the assistance groups to develop a pure and sincere desire or longing for truth. The session was recorded on the 8th of August 2017 from 12.10 p.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. G'day everyone, it's Jesus here and Mary's with me today. Mary's going to be doing some channeling, but uh, I would like to first introduce it to you because it, the channeling will be from a celestial spirit this time. You remember before the assistance groups uh, in 2016, we channeled Sonia, who wanted to talk to many of the people who were attending the assistance groups about their attitude in attending. And Sonia would like to come and speak again with those people who did attend and also those people who have watched the assistance groups on YouTube and on other video forums that we have. And what Sonia would like to talk to you about is having a longing for truth. So that's what uh, we're going to be discussing today with you and doing some channeling about today. Mm. Okay, Mary, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Mary's zoning in. Yeah. <laughs> Feels a bit nervous. Yeah, and I always feel a bit nervous when it comes to um, channeling celestial spirits because yeah. I yeah. want to do the best I can. Not for them. always. When we're home alone, you don't get no. nervous. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But because I have other emotions probably about being filmed, yeah. <laughs> that comes into play. And then, and then I don't want those um, personal emotions of mine to get in the way of yeah. the clarity of the channeling. Yeah. So I... Because we don't normally have our spirit friends talk to us quite frequently. It's, it's, yeah. just, it's just when it gets filmed, it's a bit different. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. Well, okay. let's uh, just uh, quieten up a bit and, and let Sonia have her say. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Thank you for having me back. No worries, Sonia. <laughs> I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak again with everyone mm. on this most wonderful topic of having a longing for truth and maintaining a desire for truth, even when we become overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Something that all of us observed, there have been many of us keenly observing uh, your progress through the presentation of the assistance group material. Mm -hmm. We all feel very passionately about what it is you are presenting mm. and we understand the positive impact this kind of material has the potential to have on those who willingly engage with it, mm. who have a longing for truth uh, such that causes them to engage with the material in a heartfelt way and in a sincere way of examining themselves. Mm. So we've been watching with much anticipation, encouragement, excitement for yourselves presenting, but also for those in attendance and those who watch later on in the YouTube videos. Mm. What we have noticed, however, is that many people are becoming um, overwhelmed or rather we should say are resisting the state of being overwhelmed when they attend or when they view the material mm. and because of this they often don't wish to stay with the confrontations that are happening inside of themselves as truth is received as anyone who has attended the groups and as you yourselves know the material is so full of truth that necessarily causes a confrontation with the error that is inside everyone in attendance. Mm -hmm. um, but some are more willing than others to allow that confrontation to occur. When you say some, I think you're being quite polite there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and perhaps I can be more specific. <laughs> in truth, 
Almost no one who has attended the assistance groups has allowed the truth that was presented to them either personally or in a general way to confront the error within them to the point where change has happened within their lives. Yes. In fact, we would have to say at this point, no one who has attended mm. um, has allowed for that to happen. And as such, the groups lose their impact. They are no longer useful because as you know, these groups are only useful when the material that is presented is engaged with in a heartfelt manner. Mm. And unless a person is willing to allow the truth to rumble around inside of them and shake all of those, those things that people hold dear and hold on to as if it is the foundations of their lives, mm. unless there is a willingness to allow all those so-called foundations, which as you know, are very, their foundations of bad design and bad buildings <laughs> and that and that will be dissolved uh, it, through the process of God's laws acting upon them at some point in the future. Mm. <laughs> um, but the assistance groups allow this opportunity for that to happen in a very heartfelt, desirous way and, and as such happen far more rapidly and happen in a way that brings about so much more joy so much more rapidly in a person's life. Yes, it's like there's a difference, isn't there, between someone being forced by the law to mm -hmm. give up all of their pet ideals and everything that are out of harmony with love, or someone actually going along with the law and, and, or even embracing the law. And grabbing the and opportunity. Grabbing the opportunities that now knowing the law gives you. And what we notice is that most people are really, uh, in a lot of ways, the law acts upon them in a way that they're kicking and screaming against it while the law is acting, rather than actually seeing that God's love has driven all of these laws. So therefore, all of the laws must be in place for the benefit of humankind, mm -hmm. and therefore for the benefit of myself personally. Mm -hmm. mm. And what we have noticed from the very first almost from the very first introductory talk mm -hmm. of the very first assistance group in 2016, people entered the room and there was immediately through, through your desires a, an opportunity for people to begin to take personal responsibility for where they're at and what is inside of them and also for the truth that you were presenting to reach them personally and to shake some of those foundations so that new things could become present uh, and uh, people could open up to more of God's truth, which brings about more emotion and more love is possible, both from mm. within the person and to be received by the person from mm. external sources. And what we noticed was that everyone who attended entered the room, the opportunity was presented, and almost everyone without exception withdrew either very rapidly from that opportunity to be overwhelmed or over the space of a couple of days withdrew. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the gr these, this, these same people and those who Almost, it's as, almost as if they're trying to encounter the material via YouTube. <laughs> they're yeah, sort of like a, this about it. Like, yeah, uh, there's not a strong desire even to do that, is there? No, no, not to willingly engage and allow, almost to allow the information to become a tidal wave of truth and recognition as such that would bring about the flow of emotion, mm. <laughs> which is so necessary for people if they are to truly embrace God's way of living. Mm -hmm. And what we notice is that, that people are trying to manage the flow <laughs> of truth, manage their emotion, and because of this, there is no significant change in faith, no significant change in action, no significant change in personal happiness, and no significant change in the reception of love into a person's life, either from us or from God mm. or from even those other people in their life who do love them. Mm. So really, <laughs> I've, I've embraced this opportunity to come today to try to offer 
some guidance, some truth, some confrontation for people to be encouraged towards a direction that will actually cause them to reap benefits from from the projects that you currently have underway. Mm. Yes, it's an interesting uh, issue or problem when you look at it because most people are still seeing, as, as you say, faith is a key part of it because most people are still feeling like the law is there to punish them rather than the law is there to make their lives happy. Yes. And th that's a big issue in itself, not having the faith in God's goodness that God provides laws, not uh, specifically to correct us, but of course the laws do, but, but more importantly, to assist us to grow and to in embrace happiness in particular, to be happy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, without the laws, most of the laws, we would not be happy at all. In fact, it would be and we aren't being able to obtain happiness at all. Uh, at, at all. Yeah. And, and also I speak of truth and as you know, <laughs> law is truth mm -hmm. <laughs> and truth is, is law. law. Mm. And so these two are synonymous yes. and, and there is a resistance within people to face personal truth, but also to understand that God's laws the universal truth that is operating uh, everywhere around them and within them is a part of this personal truth and that is is acting to bring about an awakening to the truth of how each of us is right now. Yeah, it's probably a misnomer to call it personal truth, isn't it? Ex exactly. I, <laughs> I it's use probably that... personal error that we really need to be uh, looking at. And, yes. and this is, but this is the beautiful thing, isn't it? The personal error within is being confronted by every law. Exactly. And every law is there to expose it and every law is there to encourage you to feel it and let it all go. And yet the majority of people, as you say, they are still under heavy control or sedation. <laughs> <laughs> control in the sense that, you know, their fear is uh, dominating their experience still. And, and sedation in the sense of trying to be in complete denial of any <laughs> issue at all. And I'm, I'm in love with this word that you use, sedation, <laughs> because this is the state that we see people who have attended the groups, they almost leave and seek sedation <laughs> from the world around them. Yes. It is as if the, the week is so intensive and so much will is being used to resist what is being presented, resist the confrontation of an emotional um, shaking of the foundations, as I call, called it earlier. Mm -hmm. There's so much effort being put in and then people leave in a state of exhaustion and try to sedate <laughs> with so many worldly addictions. Yes. And, and what we are noticing is that People then become very entrenched in worldly ways. They almost feel worse than before they attended the group and they find that they're numb for months mm. and it takes some external source such as yourself speaking again or some new trigger of um, something external to cause a person even to reflect on Oh my goodness, what just happened the last few months? <laughs> or the last year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or the months. last year. And, and really, we, we want to encourage people to analyse that this investment, it's an investment of time that a person places in attending an assistance group or viewing an assistance group online. Yeah. And it, it is an investment in your future, in your future and in the potent, it is, a possibility to begin to experience the potentials that are already available right now mm -hmm. um, and to place such an investment of even time without the um, correlating investment of energy and um, willingness or desire perhaps is the most correct terminology to use yes then without that, it becomes almost like oh, something I must do. And what we have observed that by the end of 2016, many people were feeling more, 
more sedated. negative about divine truth than when they began the year, let's face it. <laughs> yes, and more sedated in their day-to-day -day lives, less alive. And yet, if, if they were to consider this rationally and logically, to place such an investment in their development, spiritual development and love-based development in a year, and to not actually um, see it as something that required some energy or some desire or some effort on their part to bring about a change in their life, then then was it really a wise investment? <laughs> Not really. It was in some ways it can be a waste of time almost, can't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose we're, let's look at if we examine the first uh, assistance group, we raised four primary issues with people, didn't we? We yes. raised the issues of truth, yes, love, faith, and yeah. humility, you know, in other words, being open to experiencing your emotions, which is really what humility is. And so we've already looked at that issue of faith, like how that impacts it. And that's issue in faith, faith in God, God's laws, but also faith that you can actually do it. Like there's this also this other underlying thing that most people have, and that, that is they feel they can't do anything by themselves. They need somebody else always feeding them, always inspiring them, always assisting them before they can actually achieve something. And so that, that's a big issue that I feel many need to face in their personal life. And, and as you know, this isn't ever going to build a true faith. No. Because the person's, the person's soul must be engaged in order for soul-based faith to grow. Yeah. And this is why we say that without the effort, without the sense of being willing to risk something that f to um to experience a sense of risk to experience Even it's not really it, a risk exactly which is why i pause <laughs> exactly it's not a true risk from our perspective or from any fact, from the in truth fact, if we're realistic what people are doing right now is, is very, very risky, risky. <laughs> <laughs> it's very risky yeah. um in terms well there's many negative potentials that and side effects of that come into being as a result of ignoring uh truthful loving action and action yes. was the other thing that Correct. you emphasized a lot in that first group Correct. and as you as you mentioned about faith without a f without a use of action to embrace emotion or to to allow truth to uh, impact upon us, which causes a change in our emotional state, which causes us to act in different ways. Without any of these things occurring, then faith doesn't actually become a part of our soul. Yes. And that is, as you rightly point out, there is a, a feeling that others must help us grow faith but in fact, in God's universe, that's impossible. Mm. So if we examine now maybe the correlation between faith and action. Yes. Because it, it seems to me that many people attempt action without ha having any faith at all. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, they, they act because they feel they have to act or they act because they feel they must, or they, they think they're going to get threatened by God if they don't, <laughs> or whatever other reasons they have. And many of the actions are also quite selfish in the sense of driven by self-motivation, such as things like, oh, I've got to get my life a bit better than it currently is, at least. Mm -hmm. so that, that drives me to action. Or to gain some sort of approval, which is actually quite a selfish Correct. motivation. Or superiority over people. Yes. Feeling that you know more than somebody else. There's all these very, well, let's face it, they're very unloving Mm -hmm. uh, motivations for action. So we're not talking about action driven like that. No, and it, what I would like to say about that is that there is God's laws are operating on intention and desire. And so if I act out of a sense of desire for approval or if I try to do the right thing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I want to avoid getting in trouble, then, then our motivation is wrong. Obviously. Yes, and God's laws are operating upon what's in my soul. Mm -hmm. And so I can't call that a loving action. No. 
And God's laws are going to try to correct that action, in fact, taken in that. Trying to correct my unloving (laughs) action. action. (laughs) (laughs) So it's only when we sincerely choose loving actions and humble states that our faith can actually grow Mm -hmm. because our faith in God's way can grow because we are for the first time engaging God's way. Yeah. Yeah. So it requires some purity of intent, doesn't it? Yes. A, a, pur- a purity of an intent. Now, now, if we look at purity of intent, we can see that for the majority of people who, who still come to our who come to our groups and who watch on on YouTube and other online sources, there's still not an, a purity of intent. So, so the question then becomes: Well, how do I get a purity of intent? Like, how does that develop? That yes. and. How, how do we how do we change it so that we do have a pure intention to actually embrace the God's way rather than just constantly engaging God's way in the same way that we engage everything else in our lives with addiction and demand? Yes, and this is why I wanted to make the title of our discussion today about having a yearning for truth mm. because without a desire for truth, then we... We're never going to establish what our true desire is for a start. <laughs> we're going to want to say, it, we're going to want to stay in f- facade based states, which you spoke about a lot in the second group. Mm. But we're going to not want to be real mm. about how the state of play is right now. <laughs> yeah, so we need to make sure that people understand in this that, that we're not talking here about the manufacturing of state but rather being honest about how resistive they actually are to be loving. Because this is the magic. (laughs) This is the magic part of what happens when we really long for truth and are really willing to allow the truth of how we feel and who we are and what our real desires are right now. No matter how bad they seem. (laughs) No matter how much others might judge them or we might judge them, them. Mm. if we allow ourselves this deep honesty without action or, or anything else, just a deep willingness to know and feel how it is right now, that is the only way. And... Many of us here tried many other ways. Yeah, well, this is one thing I'd like to ask you about. It just maybe mentioning some of your personal experiences with that. How, how you know, obviously, most people who come from the earth are still very addicted to gaining approval and gaining acceptance and doing things the right way without it really being a heartfelt motivation. So, what personal experiences have you had in that regard when you were going through the progress on the path? Yes. So. Uh, As I think I've shared in our previous discussion, I came from a Christian background when I was on earth. Mm -hmm. And so I, and in some ways I feel exceptionally fortunate that I didn't, that I did have some purity or some understanding is perhaps the best way I could phrase it some kind of real understanding of God while I was on earth. Um, However, I I was within a Christian kind of uh, culture, if you like. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there is a lot of emphasis on um, doing the right thing. Um, moral as behavior, m- like. moral behavior yeah. as mm. defined in by a certain set of doctrines based on well, or interpreted from Bible scripture. interpreted from Bible mm. from the Bible yeah and not necessarily and certainly not in the um, church circles that I was in when I was on earth on the heart-based uh, state that would drive uh, moral actions, even moral actions that are actually in harmony with God's mm. way. Mm. And so I did have issues while I was on earth with a sense of self-denial where um, a feeling of shame about my own uh, pleasure and a feeling that, um, and by that I mean uh, doing things that made me personally happy. Mm-hmm. I, I certainly... Um, so more living a life of self-denial. Self-denial. Or self-sacrifice. Yes, because I believed that that was good and the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of my lessons have been 
or that were initially when I entered the spirit world were a lot about uh, understanding that my desires for self-denial were actually a lot about avoidance of disapproval <laughs> mm -hmm. and some some errors that I had about God mm -hmm. and what it meant to be a good person. Mm -hmm. So I had to become pretty real about... So when you became real about those things, yes. like, well, how did that feel like for you? What did it feel like for you? Because I suppose what I'm getting at is it, it seems that most people are so scared to sort of go through the reality of that for a lot of different reasons. And, and, and whatever it is that they need to face up with, like if it's a guy who's, you know, got different issues, you know, or a girl who's got different issues, there's always issues that we either have some self-judgment about or judge others for or, and so forth. Well, and many yes. of these issues come up in the process, but I suppose what I'm getting at is how did it feel like for you when you first come face to face with them? Very confronting, very confronting. I felt like I felt that I was having to own up to being a bad person, mm -hmm. that I was now not going to be lovable. I felt that the only way that I could be loved was to be a good person. Um, and as defined by a certain set of rules that I mm -hmm. had learned in a church environment while on earth, mm -hmm. and having to s come to face that I was not only a person who did actually underneath some facade have some personal desires that weren't involved in just serving others, felt to me very... Um, like I was having to admit I was a bad person, that I would always, that I was selfish and that I there was therefore not worthy of good things or love. And I had almost a black and white feeling like I was either very good or I was very bad. And acknowledging these things meant I was very bad and therefore I would never... Um, Desire to no, even acknowledge them. I didn't want to know them and I felt that by acknowledging them and knowing that they were a part of me meant that they would never be out of me. <laughs> um, and how were they made plain to you? Like, was it somebody else who was helping you come along and told you these particular things or were there personal experiences that exposed them for you? I suppose that the process started while I was still on Earth. Mm -hmm where there was a growing dissatisfaction in certain areas of my life, uh, where I didn't feel happy mm -hmm. most of the time. But instead of pausing to examine um, why, why that was happening uh, or what might be the cause of that, I did more to try and avoid <laughs> what... Um, what, as I understand it now, God's laws were attempting to expose to me, what my conscience was trying to um, help me see. Mm -hmm. And so instead of kind of pausing to analyse the state of my life and, and analyse if my actions were good or bad and how I was defining good and bad and why I felt obsessed with defining good and bad yeah. <laughs> instead of doing any of those things. I just did more and more of what I thought was good and tried to avoid more and more and suppress more and more of what I judged as bad. Mm -hmm. And so there was, by the time I hit middle age on earth, I didn't feel that happy. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't analyse that until after I passed. So would it be right to say middle age on earth you also were quite resistive to self-analysis with regard to these areas that were causing you to be unhappy? Absolutely and yeah. this is we I raise that because I notice that a lot of people on earth by the time they hit 40 mm -hmm. they've almost become completely uh, cut off to the idea of re-examining their ideas. Some people, everything in their life. Everything in their life. Mm. There's a way to do things. This is how I do them. This is their pet way because it gives them control, gives them power, gives them a sense of... It helps them sleep at night <laughs> in whatever way. It makes their fear go away, basically. <laughs> yes. And, and also they have quite a strong idea of this is what constitutes something that's good, this is mm. what constitutes something that's bad, mm. and this is... this. I, I shall never analyse that again. This is the kind of person I am. This is how I've decided I am. I'm good at this. I'm bad at that. I'm good because of this. I'm bad because of that. And they don't ever um, consider, is this a correct analysis? What am I basing my analysis on? 
Sometimes you see on earth people in their teens and their 20s and their 30s considering these things. Mm -hmm. But most people after the age of 40, 45 on earth mm -hmm. never think of those things again and in no. fact become very, as you experience, very challenged and rigid. angry, mm -hmm. rigid whenever there is uh, mention mm. of um, stirring the pot, shaking the foundations yeah. of, of... And, and it's unfortunate because in a lot of ways they don't realise that the very foundations they've built their life on basically are just the same or similar foundations to what their parents have built their life on. Yes. And there's yes. no questioning of any of these foundations at all. And there's a lot of obviously societal pressure and other things as well, which they bow to in the process. Yes. Uh, you know, being brought up in a religious faith, you, you would have felt that too. Absolutely. So what I'm getting it's at like, now, yes. okay, so we, we're now in the middle age, we're now quite resistive and we're quite <laughs> rigid. How, how do we get from a stage where, right, uh, my desire really at this point is really, I've got no faith really in God's goodness. I have got very little faith in my own ability to change. And on top of that, I have very little desire to know anything that I'm doing wrong because it just makes me feel worse about myself. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I don't want to feel worse about myself ever. So I spend most of my life avoiding emotions or situations that might make me feel worse about myself, which then, of course, engages God's laws in such a way to cause me to actually attract a whole heap of events that make me feel worse about myself. <laughs> yes. And so... This is this is a great question. Mm. And and beyond so the first thing I would like to say about that is you need to ask that question. <laughs> exactly what you just said, that is the level of self awareness that most people are resisting even mm. having. Mm. To say, okay, here I am. <laughs> This is how I feel when this guy talks about this stuff. I feel this angry, is, annoyed, and me, you know, shut down. Oh, I just want to join out and I want to get right. I want to just tell him to shut up, <laughs> whatever it is that you feel. Or, gosh, it's another thing. Or, oh, God, oh, oh, no, no here we I don't are want to. Again. Oh, well, I refuse to believe that about myself. What exactly. is he talking about? Or, that can't be right. No. Or, it, all these sorts of feelings. And then exactly. to further analyze, but hang on. I'm not getting anywhere or I'm continually, I'm not as passionate as I used to I'm be. I'm stuck in my life. I'm stuck. I don't feel creative. I'm afraid to try new things. I've, there's a level of dissatisfaction in my relationship that never seems to go away no matter what we do. Yeah. Uh, these kinds of questions, this kind of, this is a part of truth. So yeah, this is a, truth. Can we also say though that this is not just really truth, is it? Because humility is required in this self-examination yes. and so yes. that brings me to the point of emotion it's like most people most people seem to want to avoid truth because it helps them avoid negative emotion yes and that, and that seems to be the underlying reason why the majority of people don't want to grow yes it's because it helps them avoid the underlying emotion letting go of the underlying emotion recognizing it acknowledging it's there and then even experiencing it. It helps them avoid all of those things. And that's what that's what I referred to in our introduction, which was it, truth is an emotional process. And so yes. for for us here, it's very difficult to um, to pull apart emotion and truth and love and but people on earth are doing this exactly this is the problem isn't it because there is so much intellectual dominance upon the earth today truth is viewed as almost as a clinical kind of in its own box yeah. whereas once you reach uh, a state of higher development and begin to interact with god you understand that truth it causes the flow of emotion and the flow of emotion opens us up to truth yes. and that it becomes a cyclical thing. And if if truth, if, if a person feels that they are receiving or hearing truth without there being a concurrent or subsequent or almost simultaneous flow of emotion, mm -hmm. we can say that truth there isn't a heart or soul opening to truth. Correct. And that's probably what I'd like to sort of talk about a little yes. more. Yes. And, and, and that is really what I was referring to at the beginning of yes. our discussion about the rattling of the foundations that must occur. Yes. 
So there, there seems to be, uh, I, with most of the people who are still attending our groups and even those who watch the videos and so forth, there's still not really a very strong um, desire even to acknowledge that unless you actually have felt something emotionally, you are yet to actually receive the truth. And could we also say that if we are hearing a truth with our ears <laughs> and there, there is an emotion <laughs> that if we are not feeling a flow of emotion from hearing that truth, then there is some emotion that we are resisting and most often there's anger. <laughs> yes. And that also is an emotion and yes. that need you spoke earlier about the development of a pure desire dealing with this anger and this almost hatred we would have to call it a hatred of mm. truth that we feel in most people mm -hmm. dealing with that is the only way to begin to open up the flow of emotion and to which eventually leads to the development of a pure desire. Yes. So, so really, what we're saying is that if we examine the way the human soul works, which which we've we've encouraged the most of the listeners to go over a few more times, and my suggestion is still to go over that with yes. the issues of preclusion and the other issues that you face inside of yes. the soul. What These we're are really wonderful saying wonderful discussions is yeah, if the emotion itself is still present within you of resistance, then unless that emotion disappears, you are going to continue to be resistant. And that's wonderful. That is so, <laughs> from our perspective, it's, that is so wonderful, the simplicity of yes. that, in that you need only deal with that emotion. So let's look at resistance. Like you pointed out, resistance is really rage or anger, mm -hmm. whether we express it passively or aggressively. Mm -hmm. Either way, it is just really rage or anger that, that is saying, I don't want to go there. Yes. But basically, that's what it is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, if we're saying this, resi this resistance exists within us emotionally, we have reasons for its existence is what yes. we're basically saying. Yes. And unless a person releases those reasons for the resistance that exists within them, they will continue day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, even after they've passed in the spirit world, they will continue the same resistance, pro resistant process all the while God's law is working against the resistance. Yes. <laughs> and could, could we add that the only way to discover the reasons for the resistance is, is emotional. Is to feel the emotion. Is to feel the top layer of resistance with a willingness or a desire to explore whatever mm. comes up in that process. Because what we notice is people hear with their ear the truth that you just spoke, and then they say, oh, with their mind, <laughs> hmm, which is already I just wrong. heard something that I feel resistive to. I now must discover the reasons for the resistance, but they attempt it with their head. And they don't, they don't realise this really simple process is, no, they're just angry about just, having heard what they've just heard. Yes. And all they've got to do is go through this anger and rage They've yes. got to let it be there instead of passively experiencing or not experiencing yes. it or denying it. They've got to let it be there and realise it, feel it. Once they feel it, then they'll realise why it's there. Yes. <laughs> but they not, have uh, to, not, not before. They have to... <laughs> we have, I have so many ideas of analogies. <laughs> yeah, sure. like Bust like a pimple and, yes. <laughs> or, you know, just a have a out. big <laughs> vomit. Of, <laughs> just let it all... And I use those types of analogies because this is the level of judgment that people yes. have of their own resistance. They yes. think of it like vomit or pus or something putrid and yucky. And while anger is not a pleasant emotion, if we do own it sincerely in its expression, it is not harmful to others. Exactly. exactly. It is when people also hear with their ear the truth that you just said with their brain yes. and say, oh, anger, I've got to just let the anger out. But their feeling is my um, anger is someone else's problem and, and it's someone fault. else's fault. 
And when we engage with anger and the expression of anger from that place, now we wish to harm others. Yes. And is that awesome. is damaging yes. to not only the other but to ourselves. And it further darkens our own condition. Yes. Um, even if it didn't cause any damage to anybody else. But if we think about <laughs> busting a pimple or or letting some off food come up and out of us. Like a volcano erupting. <laughs> yes. It's actually a relieving thing for the system mm -hmm. for the pustulant or the infected thing to come up and out. And so it is not damaging to the system. And this is a very, we don't need to analyze this analogy too much, but it, just to, to give, the system it's, like it's so. a release, yeah. it's, it's a release and a relief. When we try to attack with daggers another person with our anger, that is never relieving or releasing. No, no, it's a cyclical thing it becomes, it builds. Well, it builds because we're also now causing more damage to ourselves, which causes more pain to um, ourselves, which we're then more angry about and so yes. forth and so forth. And if we're not careful, we can enter states of murderous rage and, if we're not careful. Yes, very true. And, and so going back to your point, which was to develop the pure desire to and to experience the reasons for the anger or the resistance, this must all be an emotional process. Yes, yeah, so, so what we're basically saying is that the majority of people who come along to the group, and, and as you say, that within the first uh, presentation, usually you start noticing it happening, if not before they walk in the door even, and they're sitting down, the, as you start discussing, there's a lot of truth coming at them, and quite often every statement has a truth that they haven't yet accepted emotionally. Now, because of that, there's going to be a build-up of this pressure cooker type of mm -hmm. feeling. Until such a point now, they have a choice now. They're either going to have to release this pressure cooker in order to hear anything, or they zone out. And what I notice when we're teaching at the groups is the majority of people, if not all people, just basically get to that point and then zone out. And yes, and this is what we notice. We notice that they zone out at that point and they zone right out and right out for months at a time. Mm -hmm. And it is only recently for some that they begin to circle back around. But they've done a long circuitous route through a lot of addictions, yeah. a lot of numbing, a lot of avoidance to come back and now really they still have to engage with the process which they could have engaged at that initial Six point. Six months ago, 12 months ago. When they were sitting in the room or first watching the, the video yeah. to say, okay, what is it I'm resisting here and what do I really feel about it? Mm. Because unless that is emotionally resolved and released and relieved, then the truth, the truth and the emotional process of receiving and absorbing and loving and embracing truth, it can't happen. Exactly, yeah. And I, I think that's important to probably emphasize is that is that unless you are actually feeling emotions as you're receiving truth, it's highly unlikely you are actually receiving truth. In fact, it's impossible for mm -hmm. you to be receiving truth in that moment. All you're doing is hearing it. And as I said in first century, quite frequently to people, they're, they're hearing things, but they're not getting the sense of it in their heart. They're not, nothing's hitting their heart because it can't hit your heart unless you actually process the thing that op opposes it hitting your heart, mm -hmm. which in most cases, like you say, is rage or anger about having to receive that particular truth. Yes. And, and so this, the purpose of this discussion is now not to... Um, shame anyone for this long <laughs> circuitous route of of uh, sedation and numbing and mm. or, and resistance it is merely to say that there are other choices that can be made and in fact yeah. it is the initial judgment of the resistance that creates a lot of problems that could easily be resolved by simply acknowledging and experiencing the resistance yes and and I suppose 
all we're trying to point out is that large amounts of time yes. in our lives can can be wasted. Firstly, you mm -hmm. know, where six to twelve months goes past and we've bar barely changed at all, if not at all. Mm -hmm. And then there's other the other problems that are associated with it is usually when we hit this wall, uh, which is, which we have to get through at some stage in our future progression. When we hit this wall of resistance, which is this rule of anger and other things that we have about law and about you know, God and about people and about, you know, there's all sorts of issues involved in it. But when we hit the wall, we have a very strong tendency to run away or ignore the wall again for long periods of time, only to find that down the track we hit the wall again. Yes. And, and, then only, and in the end, you keep hitting the wall and you keep hitting the wall and you circle around and hit the wall. Every time we circle around and go out from this wall, we often engage more in our addictions and more in our uh, unloving behaviour, which actually causes a bit of a degradation to our mm -hmm. soul. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is that the next time we hit this wall, we're less likely to actually feel like we have any motivation to get through it. So, yes. so we end up in this terrible cycle where eventually we develop a very little or hardly any motivation and we decide, oh, I'm just going to give up and I'm going to live my life as it is now for the rest of my life for as long as I can do that. Yes, and this is what we notice, sadly, um, in a number of the people who did attend the groups, which was that there was more confrontation possible. Uh, there was more... People were hearing with their ears a lot more things that challenged them emotionally. Mm. And because they had come up against some of these challenges previously, from an emotional perspective, I mean the challenge of the truth confronting some resistance within them, and they had not dealt with that, it felt more difficult and it felt also that more was required to suppress the inner sort of turmoil mm. that was created. Mm. And as you say, some people walked away and, ha and have engaged more uh, addictive emotional and physical processes yeah. to try to over calm overcome, or overcome, overcome this problem. This, this mm. problem. Yeah. And what we wish to encourage people to do is just to let, just to let it all kind of feel uncomfortable <laughs> as yeah, much as possible. Yeah, or even go possible. further than that if they can and let it just let it all hang out there. <laughs> yeah, let, <laughs> yes. let, let all of that. Let, there's so much judgment, is there, about uh, on the planet about being in control, yes. it seems to be. And, and a lot of the problem here is about this internal feeling of I've got to maintain control, you know, mm -hmm. in my life, in my emotion, with my emotion and so forth. And what we notice is that people are continually attempting to tell themselves a story of where they're at and how things are and what is happening. But because this is engaged very much in an intellectual way, in, a, in an attempt to maintain some sense of control to themselves, mm. They are acting in opposition to a soul process that's attempting to challenge the story that they're comfortable with and to tell them more, to, to, for the soul to communicate more of really what is going on from an emotional perspective. Mm. And that process does feel, as you know, quite out of control at times until one gets used to this feeling of being soul-centric. <laughs> Yes, I feel like initially I've, I do feel that for most people they're going to feel out of control. But the reality is in, the, in a very short period of time, you start realising that, wow, your life is far more manageable this way than it was any other way. And in mm. fact, for the first time, you become the person in charge of your life. Exactly. Not a, not a facade that's based on what is a perception of what other people would want or how mm. you will get power or how you will get approval or how you will get uh, to avoid fear or how you will get all these other things that are actually in opposition to the way that God created you and the way that the soul wishes to operate, which mm. is to experience, <laughs> not to manage experience. And so once we get to start to live in our soul, we begin to experience things continually and we make wise choices for ourselves, 
for the people and and thus have less negative impact on the people around us we actually begin to experience a sense of satisfaction that comes from living in harmony with God's laws, not with trying to manage and control a, a sort of uh, counterfeit sort of fleeting sense of satisfaction, which is really just uh, the maintenance of control or a facade or an image or an addiction for a short period of time for as long as we can manage it. And it takes a lot of effort. It's, it's actually quite a... Um, free place to live when we come to live in our soul and our emotions mm. in harmony with God's laws. Mm. Mm. So uh, in terms of longing for truth, uh, uh, humility obviously is a huge factor in this, isn't it? Like, it is. And, and it seems that for many of us, we find humility so difficult and yet it's one of these, well, in fact, it's probably something that we even need to develop before faith will develop into a large degree because a lot of faith will come only in time after we've released the opposing emotions whereas uh, whereas humility is something that just says wow i've got so many opposing emotions within yeah. me to truth and i've and i've really just got to surrender to each of these emotions and let them all go so that i can even absorb some truth and uh, and we've got to stop telling ourselves, which is also a lack of humility, stop telling ourselves that we're hearing truth when when we're not feeling it. Mm -hmm. And we need to start seeing that if we're not really feeling every single truth hit our soul and it ha and it's not having an impact in our day to day life, if our life isn't changing daily, then that's a strong indication that we haven't actually heard the truth at all. Yes. And and that was something that we wanted to mention also you mentioned also about how does one come to really face the resistance they have to truth the emotional resistance they have to it yeah. and also our question is how does one come to want to to want to engage with this emotional process continually mm. and to 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 desire this confrontation to happen all of the time understanding that it is the fastest way to progress yes yes, yes. and so this is what we see is lacking in a lot of people because this faith is not developed mm. but what you just mentioned is what we what we wanted to encourage people towards which is to to embrace this emotional um, confrontation as it occurs and to to allow this opening up of um, the resistance emotions sorry I just yeah, and, she, and yes. also to sort of see it isn't it a, as if it's a to see it that that this is the way like the the way that God has made is to is to actually process through everything emotionally. That That is the way. And if you're not processing everything emotionally, including every truth emotionally, then you're not on the way yet. Mm -hmm. and, and the key is that whatever other ways you were taught when you were younger, whatever other ways society says you should do it, and whatever other ways religion or people tell you you should do it, you need to sort of almost give up all of that and go, no, no, God's way is the child's way, which is this very childlike emotionally expressive process of releasing going through emotional releasing every time you're confronted with the truth and then the process will be fast and quite natural and, and i'll notice big changes in my life when these things happen and not be so worried about how it looks externally to everybody and how you are worried about how, how even worried you are about yourself while you're doing it yes and and to engage to basically to to begin to live in the way that you just described one must face the emotional opposition the false beliefs the false emotional beliefs that e that one has about inside that of way of living yeah. yes and these are inside of them they're not external to them ever no and no. it's very <laughs> tempting to say well if i do that then 
my neighbour will be like this to me or yeah. those people will think that of me or I won't be able to do this for my kids or, or whatever it is, which is really putting the blame externally. Exactly. When really these are all, these are all ideas that we have within ourselves and things that we are judging as either good or bad and... Or, or more importantly, things that we often have emotions that we don't want to feel associated with. That's right. And it's all of these things are just emotions yeah. to experience. Yeah. And, and this is, uh, I see, what, what a lot of the issue with is, of humility is this, this, this idea or concept that everything that we have to feel as we progress are just emotions. They're okay. <laughs> you can feel them, you know. It's like there's no, it's not a disaster to feel emotion no matter which one it was. <laughs> and, and there is this terrible thing on earth now is it's like you see it a lot, particularly in Western societies, how somebody just even has a cry and they straight away feel they have to be medicated <laughs> because, you know, it's they a just very need to have a sad cry. State. <laughs> it's a very sad state of affairs on the earth for it us. Is. Is. Because each time we see somebody crying in sincerity, it, um, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? it? We understand that 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 is them getting closer to living in the way that God intended, which is to be an an experiencing emotional soul. Yeah. <laughs> and so, when people feel ashamed or they feel scared of their own emotional experience. We, uh, which is very common, as mm. as you know, but it is, mm. is it is um, the majority of people who are on Earth today, especially those above the age of seven or eight, um, to feel afraid or ashamed of their own emotional experience. Mm. Um, we see just just the. Um, it's almost diametrically is. opposed to the way that the celestial heavens are constructed. The lifestyle on Earth <laughs> yes. compared to the lifestyle <laughs> yes. in in the in the, the one spheres. state, yeah. yes, is is almost diametrically opposed. And so we do understand that this is this is um, quite a quite a state that people are having to overcome to to work through emotionally yeah and their emotional belief systems that need to be given up is there there's no yes. medication in the celestial heavens to stop you from feeling an emotion <laughs> <laughs> no such things uh would never even be able to physically exist, exist here. exactly yes. yeah. <laughs> they, they're their construction and their design is not supported yes. by physically the by, the by the law, the law mm. uh, that we that governs our our spheres. So, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that that uh, that to me also is the is an issue, isn't it? This whole which are, and so really, when you look at it, uh, what we're basically saying is the very things we covered in the very first <laughs> assistance group are the very reasons why most people are, shut, uh, are now shut down and not, not wanting to embrace the assistance groups. Yes. So, so in a lot of ways, it would be advisable to go back to the very beginning, to the very beginning of these assistance groups and start to uh, feel about what emotions are going on inside of ourselves that cause us to want to enter a state of resistance. And, and this is one of the reasons why Mary and I will be going through the questions, as you know, uh, that we've, we've put together. Interestingly enough, we've had to put together our own set of questions because we've barely received any questions whatsoever mm. about the assistance. Yes, and I suppose that in my desire to come here and speak with you all again today was really about because I'd had that opportunity before everyone engaged with these groups mm -hmm. to, and if you remember the theme of our discussion then, it was very much centered around truth as well. Exactly. Um, and what we observed happen in this first group and in the subsequent groups, um, but especially in the first group, most people found that content the least appealing as it was being presented mm -hmm. um, because it did confront a lot of, the very common resistance within people to self-responsibility, but also to to um, experiencing fear, experiencing grief, and experiencing um, a shake-up <laughs> of what they perceive to be good, right, 
bad, wrong, uh, to be willing to reassess those things at a time in their life when they have decided on being very set about those things because it helps them to maintain a sense of, as you mentioned earlier, control mm. or a sense of feeling um, that they are a righteous person, mm. I suppose, is the best way to put it. Mm. Um, so the management of fear and the management of image. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so those things uh, are going to be necessarily shaken up because, as I mentioned, the way that people perceive those things on earth today are di diametrically opposed to God's way. Mm -hmm. In most cases, yeah. there are some exceptions. Mm -hmm. So so what um, I suppose my purpose today was, was really to sort of call people's attention to the fact that, um, hey, you've really shut down. <laughs> This thing happened, we saw happen, mm -hmm. where you came into a room, things were presented, or you clicked on a video, things were presented, and a lot, a lot of um, emotion within you was challenged and you didn't allow yourself to experience it. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why you felt numb, sedated, shut down, struggling, whatever it's been since that moment in time mm. because we, we just wanted to remind people of this because again this year now as you start those the series of questioning as you mentioned um, that you just mentioned there's another opportunity to engage with the material anew mm. Mm. yeah and at any point in time obviously we can change yes from having our resistance to or from living in our resistance to actually having our resistance emotionally, having it and working our way through it rather than denying we have it. Yes. And uh, that can happen at any time. But again, as you point, correctly pointed out, that's a choice, isn't it? That's it a is. decision we have to arrive yes. at internally, emotionally, a decision. Yes. Mm. And it, 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 as we mentioned at the start of our discussion here between the two of us, it must be a sincere desire to acknowledge this mm -hmm. rather. We can't make that decision in uh, out of duty mm. <laughs> or out of facade. We can't beat ourselves up into that, uh, force ourselves and berate ourselves into that decision. Mm. We can't do it out of guilt or fear. It must be sincere. And in order for that sincerity to grow, we must face emotionally the truth of how we feel towards truth and god and love right now mm. and be willing to experience that mm. yeah i find mm. it interesting mm. that um historically a lot of people as you know have asked me why is it that divine truth is so slow you know to take off on the planet why why is it that it uh, seems to be that it's a barely growing at all, you know, in many, in many cases. Obviously, it's what mm. we see, but it's not necessarily the truth. But um, why is that the case? And, and interestingly enough, the very people who ask me the question usually in the end don't practice divine truth on the planet. <laughs> and that is often because they want to be a part of something that helps them, as you pointed out earlier, that they perceive would help them grow faith mm -hmm. from external means or to be feel secure in a larger group rather mm. than them ex having their own experiences yes, and, and developing I, and I feel a true too, faith. It's also an indication, isn't it, that um, the, um, the, the whole asking of that question is like a, um, what's the word? It's, it's, like, it's like an indication that you don't understand how hard it is. <laughs> yes, and that was the subsequent thing I wanted to mention yeah. was that it, these, such people don't understand the, the, the way in which the earth life operates commonly, the emotions which, which drive the earth life for 98% of the population on the planet yeah. um, are in opposition to God's way. Yes. <laughs> and so it does require some 
effort, some striving, some yearning, some longing, some sincerity in the heart and soul of an individual in order for them to begin mm. to overcome through an emotional process the the opposition that exists towards God and God's way on earth. But it's, I, I don't think it's just the opposition that exists externally, is it? No, we're, no. We're talking here the about the opposition that's existing inside yes. the person. Yes, and uh, yes, we need to make that mm. very clear. Yeah. Because just because 98% of the world's population is in this state, my point there was not that it is everyone else who is... Uh, uh, we are equally, those living on earth, are equally um, carrying this opposition yes. to, to God's way. And so the internal opposition to God's way is... It's quite immense, really. It's quite immense. And it is, um, once faced, the external opposition... Is it, it was almost nothing, it feels. Yes, holds yes. almost no power. Yeah. But this is really the point of our discussion is to begin to emotionally acknowledge and experience the level of opposition within oneself yes. is the beginning of true aspiration and is the thing that will create a sustained desire for truth over time. Yes. So unless a person really has a longing to see the truth, that all of the opposition or the majority of the opposition in their life is actually coming from within themselves towards receiving truth. Mm -hmm. um, unless they're willing to actually take some action to do something about that, to actually desire to do something about that, to change that, yes. then it's highly unlikely there will be any real change in their life the entire time they're on earth. Yes. And in fact, if there is change, it might even be in a negative direction because of the addictions we're continually engaged as a result of opposing this natural process that God's designed. Yes, because as you've pointed out to groups in the past, it takes more and more effort to suppress the um, awareness that God's laws mm -hmm. are attempting to um, raise within an individual. Mm. And so therefore, a lot more... Um, addictive or avoidance type behaviours are necessarily engaged, which does degrade the mm. condition of the individual. Yes. So a lot of people who uh, talk about divine truth, they, who have been a part of it for a few years, also have the viewpoint that we're not, Mary and I are not doing enough to further divine truth on the planet, you know, that, that the reason why it's not growing is because of us. Mm. And, and I feel that that uh, also, to a large degree, uh, tries to try it helps them avoid the personal responsibility of the the personal opposition that exists inside of them as well. And really, um, from our perspective, we view we don't view um, we understand that God's way and the embracing of God's way is an individual endeavor and choice, a soul by soul process mm. governed by the will and desire of each individual mm. and so we don't see a movement or no. a no. group or a people on a path we don't as a, as a collective that's not how we if view... we're honest at the moment there's very few people on the path <laughs> anyways <laughs> but we, i suppose but there is no... what i'm attempting to say is that we view people as individuals with individual choices and an individual condition and an individual, and an individual path, path mm. and and god's way is um it, it's not as you know it's not something that one decides to embrace with a certain group or in a certain sphere of one's life it's something that impacts every decision mm. um, but we never think that it is something that um, we don't tally numbers or <laughs> the way that many people on earth do i'm trying to draw that comparison we see each person who comes to your assistance groups as individuals at a certain point on their individual 
journey with a certain individual mm. soul condition and a certain individual set of choices that involve um, part of the choices that everyone has is will they engage God's way or not. Mm -hmm. But um, there are ways in which different people resist. There are different emotions and, mm. and we sort of, there will never be a time when everyone in a room is in exactly the same condition either. No. And Everyone's so, quite emotionally unique, shall we say. Emotionally unique but, and, and their the progress. Are emotionally unique. Their, mm. their injuries and their openness towards God's way is individually unique. And that's It's a lot. not an open and shut Door. Yeah, but even, even that, though, the main reason why that is the case is because of the injuries, isn't it? Like God, exactly. God designed the soul so open and so willing to experience emotion. Yes. And yet, very, very, very short time, usually oftentimes before we're even born, there's already resistance to feeling it. Yes. And, uh, and that's a very sad, and sad fact of humanity's choice for centuries now, millennia, which, which we need to also reverse. So it's like... In a lot of ways, I sort of see it like stopping a, a runaway train going yes. in the wrong direction. And, and, you know, initially it appears that you're not having too much of a success while the runaway train is slowing by just occasional <laughs> amount of momentum every single you know, moment you're resisting it. And the key, the, key is, the key is for people to understand how they slow that train. Yes. Because there are people attempting to slow the tr addiction train, if we could call it, or the um, <laughs> or the um, the rebellion train, or the, whatever the, the the train towards dark darkening condition mm. is. What's driving that train? Mm. Um, the key is to see what slows it down, because many people are just trying to do it through a force of willpower. Exactly. And that's not helping, and that's mm. another reason why they end up feeling worse and more shut down and more sedated. And also more uh, tired as well, yes. obviously, because they're, yes. they're putting forward an effort that their soul is really saying, I don't want to make that effort. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't see the point in that effort. No. Yeah. No. I, I was thinking, though, you, you raised a question earlier in our discussion mm -hmm. about some of the experiences that I needed to go through in mm. order to um, come to really grow a pure desire to to embrace God's way. Yeah. That was your questioning, wasn't it? Yes, and also the, the emotions associated with that, like what made you angry, for mm -hmm. example? What mm -hmm. made you feel like you just didn't want to do it? Or, and what was hard for me and what to was acknowledge. Hard. Yes, yeah. and those kind of things. So what I was thinking was... Um, if you remember before the start of the assistance groups, I came and I spoke and then a number of people came and talked about just their general experiences after passing. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a desire here amongst us to bring to you a, a number of people who are either going through this process or have recently been through this process of, mm. of having to come to grips with their opposition to the raw to humility <laughs> and to truth. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And so to to talk with you about what that process is like, because mm. perhaps that would help some of your viewers as well. I think so. I, I feel that um, there is such an, a large amount of judgment about this sort of raw emotional process that everyone at some point, if they want to embrace God's path, they're going to have to embrace at some point. So. Yeah. Um, you know, it'd be good to maybe discuss with different people who are going through that now and not like there's not too many that I observe going through it on earth. So the best opportunity we have is to discuss with some who are maybe going through it in the spirit world mm -hmm. who, who can say, yeah, I'm real angry about this at the moment or I'm real, you know, I'm real like annoyed about that and I've been so afraid about dealing with this and, you know, just... Yeah. And they're willing, uh, just the willingness, I suppose, um, to be open and frank about the, that, uh, those emotions. Because it seems to me that one of the most difficult things people uh, go through on earth is that there's a general lack of willingness to be open and frank about what they're really experiencing, and we get even to themselves. We experience a spark of joy every time someone is willing to just be honest with themselves or mm. or someone around them about what they really feel. Yeah. And what we notice is some people uh, 
say they're being honest about it, but really they're they're trying to talk around the point Mm -hmm. of what they feel because they're afraid and not willing to experience the fear of just saying, this is what I feel about what just happened or this is what I really want to do. Mm. Um, But then there are others who are beginning to feel like, oh, look, I'm struggling with this or I don't want to give this up or Mm. I'm starting to feel pain about this aspect of my life, but I don't really want to change it. And every time we see that, we experience a sense of um, joy because we Mm. know that there's hope then of a sincere desire growing. Yes, the person is out of the... The stupor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, they're embracing, embracing some of the principles. They they are willing to f- acknowledge a feeling mm. that opposes uh, a um, even a, a feeling that opposes a humble state. Mm. That is a step towards hum- humility, in fact. Ironically. Ironically. <laughs> but this is, this is the beautiful simplicity yes. that excites us so much. Yes. Because once people start to learn that process, so much more becomes possible in a very rapid way. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, um, I, I don't know whether you've got any more you want to say, because it, cause if you do, we can finish off uh, with what you want to say. And then, and then perhaps what we might do is just have a short break. And some of the ones who have some of those raw experiences they'd like to, that they're okay to share about um, might be able to come and we can have a chat with them about their, you know, the things that they're feeling quite raw about. Um, and that might help some of the listeners to, to actually see, you know, what they might need to face a, a, as a part of their, their opening up to their true emotional condition rather than just the feeling that they don't have these particular issues. Yes, yes. Um, so that's that's a wonderful plan. Yeah. That's what we were, that's what I was hoping we could do. Yeah. Um, and also I would be happy to share a little more of of what I went through in that process after passing in dealing with some of the things um, that I felt ashamed of or that I felt that I really shouldn't have to embrace if I was going to live God's way. Yeah, so let's do that. We'll have a short break now, and then perhaps if we start with your experience and then we'll go to the other spirits who uh, want to also mention their experiences, that would be good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.